Hey guys, it's Graham. What's cracking? Let's talk synchronicity. I uh, got a notification last week that Oppenheimer is now on Prime Video. And uh, since I, like millions of Americans, pay for Prime because shipping, uh, I ended up having it. I was like, well, I didn't want to go see it in the theater, but uh, it'll be more convenient to watch it while I'm drawing and stuff. So I put it on and I uh, made it through and for the most part I enjoyed it. It was very well done. And if you saw my tweet thread about it, I had some thoughts. Um, I got the same impression from the movie as I got from the book American Prometheus by Bird and Sherwin, which I read last summer in lieu of seeing the movie. And that was the book that inspired Christopher Nolan to make the movie. And uh, it followed it pretty faithfully. I think they did a great job of showing the jumps through time without labeling them. Uh, Christopher Nolan likes to do that with his movies. You show things kind of out of a linear sequence, but you still get the whole story by the end. He did that with Batman Begins. Um, not so much with Dark Knight, but there was a little bit of jumpiness with Dark Knight Rises. He definitely did it with Dunkirk uh, to great effect. I feel like I enjoyed that movie more than most people did. And obviously time travel, not time travel, but time displacement played a huge role in Interstellar. In this one, the makeup department gets a lot of the credit because they had to do different things with Killian Murphy's hair and face and stuff to show him when he was in university, when he was traveling, when he got hired for the Manhattan Project versus later on when he was going through the hearings to not renew his security clearance. Um, I always talk about that book kind of in the same breath as Blacklisted by History by M. Stanton Evans, uh, a man who went to great efforts to really reclaim the reputation of Joe McCarthy, which has been slandered by the public education system uh, in to an incredible extent, and you know, the entertainment complex as well. He, he brings the receipts. He brings the data. Unfortunately, books like that make for very long slogs in terms of just reading them straight through. You've got to sort through a lot of hard facts to break the mystique of the narrative built around him. And so it can make for a very dry read. A similar thing happens at the back half of American Prometheus. And I, I mention that because the latter half of the Oppenheimer movie, which focuses on, um, excuse me, Admiral Louis Straws, blaming Oppenheimer for the Soviets getting the bomb, like that whole courtroom drama bit, I feel like it was played up a little bit more dramatically in the movie than I remember it being in the book. Now, granted, I was listening to the book while I was at work, and uh, I just remember that the last half of it, it got into a lot of details about the notes from the hearings, and this person accused him of that, and blah, blah, blah. It was also colored by the fact that the book was largely an apologetic effort by two communists who wanted to exonerate Oppenheimer for the accusation of communism. So keep that in mind. Uh, it's not to say that the book was bad or anything or to necessarily dispute the facts, but any editorialization around Oppenheimer, you, it needs to be brought to light like what the uh, particular inclinations of the writers were just so that you know like where, where are they going and what's the possible bias that can leak in. It, it happens. So where am I going with all this? Uh, well, the nonfiction book being the basis for a fiction movie, you got to understand that there's, there's going to be a little bit of Hollywoodness to it. You would expect as much. And so uh, I don't have particular points to emphasize, well, like, okay, well, what were the actual facts of the story versus... Uh, the narrative that Christopher Nolan was putting on screen to satisfy the dramatic needs of a motion picture. Like how personal really was it for, uh, for straws to go after Oppenheimer? I'm not saying that it wasn't. I'm just saying that I don't remember the details of the book sticking out in that way. The way it's laid out in the movie, uh, straws, when he had a government position, he wanted to authorize some shipment of nuclear isotopes to Norway, or excuse me, he wanted to block the shipment of nuclear isotopes to Norway, and it ended up in government committee hearings, and Oppenheimer testified in favor of shipping the isotopes, and he did it with a little bit of 
humor and sarcasm, uh, but also apparently scientific backing. The man was a physicist. But the way that it's portrayed in the movie, he did it in such a fashion that it kind of humiliated Straws. And Straws took that personally, and so he waited until uh, there was a chance for him to humiliate Oppenheimer by not having his Q clearance renewed in, in uh, the 50s, because um, the Soviets got the bomb in 1949. The movie shows Straws feeding uh, an FBI dossier a file on Oppenheimer to a man named Borden, who then testified in the hearing against Oppenheimer and, uh, again, like kind of kangaroo courted him outside of the public eye. All of this to make Oppenheimer look like a, a sympathetic figure. Whether he is or not, I think is kind of in the eye of the beholder because I've read this book by the two communist apologetics and I've also got friends in the uh, uh, so-called extremist right-wing sphere that have read the Venona secrets and some of the uh, decrypted cables and stuff that came out in the 90s. And they're very much in the camp that Oppenheimer was a Soviet asset, whether he deliberately knew it or not, he was surrounded by enough people who were and he wasn't careful enough around them and uh, you know, they actually name him apparently in the Venota Secrets. Keep in mind, I haven't read this yet. It's on my list too. But he's credited by the USSR as being instrumental in their obtaining key information that they needed to, to build the bomb. So it is, as my associates claim, I'm going to have to read the Venota Secrets to find out for sure. The point is that Oppenheimer is a, a bit of a divisive figure, largely depending on what your perspective is. Uh, you know, in, in the modern day. There are facts to support certain perspectives. I, I would imagine that the, the truth is somewhere more in the objective realm beyond what your particular perspective is, and I don't have enough of those objective facts to make my own conclusion. I will say that Oppenheimer is a man of extremes. Uh, he's got extreme admirable qualities, his intellect, of course, with physics, you know, the, the breakthroughs that he made, and uh, he's obviously a very talented polyglot and uh, a polymath, we'll even say. I do remember this part from the book, and they were able to portray it in the movies, where he was going to go to the Netherlands to teach for a while. And rather than teach in English, as a lot of Dutch students were capable of learning in English, like, this dude crammed Dutch into his brain in six weeks, enough to give the lectures that he wanted to give in the native language of his students. Uh, incredibly difficult thing to do. Granted, Dutch is closer to English than Spanish is, which is the other language I speak, but you, you get it. He was an extremely intelligent man. Um, apparently also a bit of a man whore. Uh, he, he met up with uh, Gene Tatlock. That was portrayed in the movie as it was in the book. And even though they had a thing going, he was also nailing a married woman that he eventually married. Um, what's her face? Uh, Emily Blunt's character. Uh, but he was still having the affair with Tatlock even after he was married uh, and, and had a child. And then after Tatlock died, he had an affair with, with Ruth Tolman. I want to say that's what was uh, implied in the movie. I couldn't remember that part from the book or not. But obviously a man of, of uh, moral failings in his personal life and commitments. And uh, you know, so you could, you could find things to admire in, uh, in him at one end of the spectrum, and other things where it's like, oh, holy crap, on the other end. Uh, this does at least make him a compelling figure for a feature such as this. Uh, the movie definitely didn't need the sex scenes in it. Um, I mean, no, movies never do. And uh, the handful of F-bombs that were in it, like, he's done, he's dropped F-bombs in other movies, like his PG-13 movies. Like, it felt like it was just a little bit too forced to get the R rating without being necessary to do so, and I, I just wonder, like, if this had been the same, like, the same rating, the same level as his other features, would it have done better? But granted, it did well. It turned a profit. I want to say it did well, like, $800 million at the at the global box office, which is a big deal for an R-rated feature. It just could have done more if it had been, uh, you know, tempered to reach uh, a broader audience, but that's all up to the artist himself. Uh, the cast was utterly loaded. It just seemed like every few scenes you were getting a, not necessarily a cameo, but just a small bit part by somebody with recognizable clout. Like, oh, let's bring in Colonel Pash. Holy crap, that's Casey Affleck. 
Let's bring in uh, Vannevar Bush. Oh, crap, that's Matthew Modine. Uh, well, let's bring in um, Isidore Robbie. Holy crap, that's David Crumholtz. So there's, there's all these people that you recognize from other films, from TV or whatever, like outside of the big parts. I swear the only recycled Christopher Nolan actor that wasn't in this movie was Michael Caine because he retired. Everybody else was in it. We didn't get Christian Bale. <laughs> He's been in plenty of, uh, of Nolan projects. Uh, Gary Oldman had a bit part as Truman. Um, I'm, I don't remember the Truman interaction. Like I've, I've heard of the Truman interaction between him and Oppenheimer and how like he, he basically said of Oppenheimer, like quit being a weenie. You didn't kill those people. I dropped the bomb. Uh, that's put into the movie. I don't know how much uh, historical fact is behind that particular interaction, but I've heard a couple of people talking about it in an apocryphal sense. Um, this is just goes to show you that David McCullough is a lot friendlier to his biographical subjects than other biographers tend to be, because I read the David McCullough biography of Truman, and you'd, you'd have him as like a top 10 president all time if you read that book, whereas other writers that were a little bit more willing to examine the flaws of these people wouldn't be so effusive in their praise of them. But McCullough likes to do that. Whereas others, others will actually highlight the things that these men did that were not so admirable. Anyway, as a final note, let's talk about synchronicity. Uh, I've mentioned this channel before yesterday, today, it's run by a couple of brothers at Idaho state that do uh, a weekly radio series of old 1940s music and uh, dramatic productions and they're usually themed you know they'll have themed episodes for the holidays and stuff or um, you know they'll, they'll just pull together a bunch of clips that are on the same wavelength and they'll mash it all together in one thing uh, this week's episode was all about communist stuff and apparently there were a lot of like folksy anti-communist songs in the 1940s and I have to put together a playlist as well as a dramatic production of some guy who was a, a, a spy against the communists for the FBI uh, on behalf of, well, on behalf of them, like to, to infiltrate the American Communist Party and try to out communists who were uh, subverting the country's interests in Washington. I think it's safe to say that they failed. Nevertheless, uh, hey, there was a time when the FBI was actually up to good stuff. Now they're just attacking anybody who... Uh, not necessarily is not acting in the interest of country, but more not acting in the interest of the government, but I digress. Anyway, I really like that channel, and uh, not all of their episodes are great, and their bumpers are kind of boring, but uh, this one was really, really good. I want to find the individual tracks that they've compiled for it, and uh, you know, add them to my summer playlist. <laughs> anyway, overall verdict on the Oppenheimer movie, three and a half stars. Um, Fantastic performances, incredible cinematography. I love Nolan's commitment to practical effects as much as possible. Uh, the way that they portrayed Oppenheimer's perspective of the universe, Adam's wavelengths and all of that. Fantastic, great cast, great uh, dramatic moments, rise and fall and all that. Um, and he did a great job of just bringing that particular period of American history to life. Excuse me. Uh, I don't know how much of it uh, in the finer details actually lines up with the facts, but the same thing can be said of the American Prometheus book, which I also generally enjoyed you know, as to whether it's a, a hard, truthful account of what all went on. I don't know. Uh, I definitely will say that I'm, I'm intrigued by Oppenheimer as a figure. He just did a lot of things that I don't admire and I'm not talking about the Manhattan project. Anyway, that's it for now. Y'all drive safe. See you out there.